Hello, Miss Kertzman. Thank you very much for uh, your time. Uh, we will uh, record the, the interview. I am first uh, uh, Moldovan journalist who want to speak with you. Yes, Mr. Roskam. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, please tell us about your family history. What uh, were the reason for uh, leaving Besarabia? Uh, my parents were born in Besarabia. They came to America before the war when they were children. My father was born in a little town. I don't know if it's a big city now or how do you pronounce it? It's Edinti. I don't know how you pronounce it. Or Yedenitz in Yiddish. Yedenitz. Yeah, then it's, and my mother is from a little uh, train station town that is called Ternova. I don't know if it still exists or what happened to it. I don't know. Doesn't sound familiar to you? I don't hear. Ternova. Doesn't sound familiar ah, to you? Ternova. Ternova is in Dondushen district. Ternova. Is that what? It's uh, Tirnova. Yeah. D uh, Dondushen district. Oh, uh, okay. So they were born separately in one in Tirnova and the other one in yeah, and it's And they came with their parents before the war. My father in 1933 and my mother in 1936. And they grew up here in Colombia. My father came here when he was seven years old. And my mother was four years old. And they eventually they met and got married and had children. We are four children. And we are first generation uh, Moldovians here. Mm -hmm. uh, why was uh, Colombia chosen as a uh, final destination? Because uh, the immigration to the US, the USA was close to Jews, they were Jewish. The immigration to several countries was close to Jewish people. So the only country that was left was Colombia. And they, they didn't have any choice. They just have to escape Europe. So they they chose to they chose to come to Colombia. Uh, what did your grandparents do in Colombia the first period to support their families? They had a store, they sell the clothes and clothing and dresses for women and they had this little store they were successful it was in downtown and it was successful and my father my 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 great my grandfather from my mom's side he was a very successful tradesman he had also a store also for women's clothes but he made a lot of money. He was very successful. And he built the buildings in Cali, the city where he was at. Because my parents came, my father's family came to Medellin. And my mother's family came to Cali. Eventually, they met in Medellin and they got married and lived in Medellin. But my grandfather from my mother's side was very successful. And they, they were a group of people from Moldova that came to Colombia because it was the only place that was less for Jews. Uh, how big is your uh, dynasty now? No, we are oh. in the third generation. I have a sister who's living in Israel. She has grandchildren. So we are like four generations now. Uh -huh. And my brother also has a, a granddaughter and my sister has two children, so we are like in the fourth generation now. Uh, maybe you know, uh, how large is the community of Bezerabian immigrants in Colombia now? I don't know. There were a lot of people, but it was in the hundreds, not in the thousands, because Colombia was a very small country and they were not, uh, they were not uh, familiar with the immigration system. They didn't like it. The Minister of Foreign Affairs was anti-Semitic, so he didn't accept many Jews. But from Romania, many of them came from Besarabia, from Moldova now. Uh, 
because uh, they knew each other and they told each other that Colombia was a good country to make business and to grow a family. So, but they were not in the in the thousands; they were in the hundreds. Uh, what do you know about the uh, Republic of Moldova? Nothing. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> uh, no. We need to work. <laughs> Any there uh, any cool, uh, are there any culinary products that you prepare according to your grandparents' uh, recipe? Yes, mamelige. Ah, okay. Uh, are you familiar with mamelige? Yes, yes. It's national yeah, uh, okay. dish. Uh, today in Moldova is uh, uh, Saint Elijah Day, and we eat. Uh, Cucumbers with uh, honey. To what? Uh, today, it's a yes. holiday, uh, Saint Elijah in Moldova. And, oh. and, and this day we eat cucumbers and uh, honey. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm not familiar with Moldova at all. Uh, no. It's Saint Elijah. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Tell us about your uh, parents. How did they adjust between two cultures? One of uh, from family and one from Colombia? Uh, it was not difficult to really melt. It, it, they didn't melt with the computer, with the community. They kept separated. We had a Jewish school for us children. They have a Jewish club for us. And uh, they met with other people from Moldova and some other countries from Europe, from Poland. There were people and from Russia and Germany, a few. And there was a big sense of community. Uh, they did things together. They tried not to, not to assimilate with the population. They, tr they tried as the kids to get married into the faith. It was more, more important the Jewish tradition than the Moldovian tradition. Mm -hmm. What did your uh, parents do in uh, Colombia? My parent, uh, pa my father passed away six, six years ago. He had a shoe factory. Mm -hmm. He was successful for a while in a shoe factory, but then uh, he had problem with the workers and with the union and he had to close the factory. My mom is a homemaker and she dedicated her life, her life to her four children. She never worked. She worked at the end when my father lost the shoe factory. She worked with him. They sold pasta products to a grocery store. So they tried to, they tried to survive after the factory was closed. And now my mother is receiving the retirement from my father and the rent uh, from two commercial offices that she has, and she lives on that. Uh, were you tempted to find uh, out more about your uh, roots? Yeah, but uh, it was very difficult because here people who, their parents came from Poland, for example, are getting their Poland the passports, the government of Poland is very friendly and the consulate of Poland in Bogota gives nationality, nationality to Poland, the children, to Polish children. But with uh, Moldova, it's difficult because it was Romania. And now uh, Romania said that it had nothing to do with it because it's now Moldova. And Moldova doesn't have a representation here in Colombia. There's not a consulate or an ambassador. So, and they said that all the records from that part of uh, that era were lost. So we were not able to find our roots. In uh, Sao Paulo exists the uh, honorary consulate of uh, Moldova, uh, Mr. Flavio Bittelman. If you want, I can connect you with him uh, to know if you want. Ah, oh, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, uh, please, uh, let's speak about uh, you. Uh, please tell about uh, 
Colombia positive the arms we only know of in the news and want to know yeah. more. Colombia is a very violent country. We have guerrillas here. We still have guerrillas. And um, but uh, even with that problem, Colombia has progress and is the oldest democracy in Latin America. We have now a change of government. It will be a socialist country for the first time, a social socialist government. We hope that uh, there won't be problems with that. Uh, but Colombia has been independent since the 1800s, independent from Spain. And our biggest uh, business uh, uh, partner is the United States. We have an agreement uh, for a uh, free trade agreement with the United States. We have another agreement with the European Union. Uh, the economy is based on oil and mining, uh, coal, emeralds, gold. Uh, it's a big producer of flowers, the second in the world after Holland and Israel. And uh, it's a good place to live if uh, in, the, in the urban areas. In the rural areas, it's still dangerous because of the guerrillas. But, but we have our little lives here and we survive and we work. So it doesn't affect us. It's been a factor that has been all over our, he our, our heads all our lives, so we're, we're used to working in those conditions. You became director of the National Taxes and Customs Agency. Was there a lot of competition for this position? Enseguida doy lectura del decreto 1701 del 18 de agosto de 1998. Nómbrase la doctora Fanny Kersman en el cargo de directora de impuestos y aduanas nacionales en reemplazo del doctor Gustavo Humberto Cote Peña, ¿A quién se le aceptó la renuncia? Yo estoy amoroso y promete solemnemente a la patria cumplir la constitución y las leyes y llenar fielmente, según su leal saber y entender las funciones de su cargo como directora de impuestos y aduanas nacionales. Si es así, que Dios y la patria lo premien, si no, él y ella os lo demandan. Seguida firma el doctor Juan Hernández Celis, secretario general de la presidencia. Yes, I studied in the, at the Universidad de los Andes, which is a top-notch university in Colombia. All the leaders say are students from that university. And I had the occasion of meeting many high officers in the government and with time. I made a career in journalism. I was uh, editor of a newsletter, then editor of a magazine, of a business magazine that was very, very successful. And I became, <coughs> sorry, I became famous in, in the whole country with my magazine. And then I joined a presidential campaign, Andres Pastrana's presidential campaign. And I was a uh, money, Money, um, a money raiser mm -hmm. for the campaign. And when he was named president, uh, he told me that he wanted me to be the director of the DN, the Tax and Customs Agency, because I have a, a re reputation of being very severe and very serious. So yeah, well, I was very successful. Uh, I lasted there two years and all my reputation come from that job. Uh, people know, knew me all around the country. I was in the commercials for paying taxes. I made the commercials with uh, two Doberman dogs, and people were scared of the dogs. They thought that they were my dogs, but it was just the, the commercial the, in the, in the, on TV. And then I was named ambassador of Colombia to Canada. So for three years, I was the ambassador in Canada, in Ottawa, and I was very happy with that job, but I had to resign when there was a change of government. So I, then I went to the United States and I joined a company called Bell South International that had an operation of cellular telephones 
in Latin America, in 10 countries in Latin America. And I was responsible for external affairs all in Latin America. And then I worked for Philip Morris International, mm -hmm. that is the cigarette company, the, to the tobacco company, that I was also responsible for external affairs in Latin America. And I stayed living in the United States for 50 years. Uh, amazing. Uh, when you are the, were the director of uh, agency, you managed to bring an additional two billions to the uh, dollars to the budget. What is the key of success? <laughs> We had a tax reform that raised the value added tax value. So we were able to raise more money with the value added tax. And also I made a campaign for people to comply with the rules because many people evade the taxes. And my campaign was very successful with the dogs and people were scared of not paying their taxes. So I was able to raise two additional billion uh, dollars in to the to the government. In your opinion, should tax be lower in amount or lower in number uh, of uh, uh, tax to simplify things? The taxes should be low and extensive to all products, not to make exceptions. But they should be low so everybody pays and there's no incentive for a tax evasion. Uh -huh. uh, let's speak about uh, uh, work as ambassador. When you can become a Colombian ambassador to, to Canada, what were your biggest challenges uh, during that time? The reputation of Colombia, because we had a reputation that there were paramilitary, that the armed forces were linked with the paramilitary and they were culpable of all the problems. Uh, the guerrilla had very good relations all across uh, Canada. They had many people who supported them instead of supporting the government in our fight. So the most difficult was to change the reputation that Colombia had. And I was able to do that. What were the argu arguments to restoring the credibility of the state? That it's a democracy, that it's the oldest democracy in Latin America. There's never been a coup d'etat in the country. There's never been a dictatorship and that the armed forces are are legitimate they don't they, they don't work along the paramilitary the guerrillas are narco traffickers drug traffickers and that both guerrillas and paramilitary live on drug trafficking if it were not for the drug trafficking there would be such a problem of guerrilla paramilitaries in colombia uh how were uh, you able to quickly solve the regional security problem after the 2001 because the groups from Colombia were involved in this process uh, after 2001 came a very strong president that was able to defeat the guerrillas and make them sign a peace agreement in 2016 uh, the government of Alvaro Uribe lasted eight years and he was able to defeat the guerrillas and make them put them in a situation where they had to negotiate a peace agreement with the government. So, uh, and after President Uribe's uh, period came Juan Manuel Santos, who uh, signed a peace agreement with the guerrillas and they quit the, the weapons and they assimilated to society. So Colombia was successful in finishing the guerrilla problem, but there were dissidents that are still uh, in the drug trade that are still fighting the Colombia system. Uh, is negotiating a free trade agreement, uh, it's a difficult, a difficult uh, process. Who are actors involved uh, to do risk management? Maybe government, maybe business, maybe ecology, maybe central uh, central bank, maybe trade unions. Uh, Can you repeat the question? Uh, is negotiation uh, 
a free trade uh, trade agreements a difficult process who are the no, actors no yeah go ahead uh, who are the actors involved to do risk management uh, the for a free trade agreement you need the will of the other country and uh, first it's a political decision of the highest level so we were able to do it with Canada because uh, my president, Alban Uribe, spoke with Canada's prime minister uh, and convinced him to have a free trade agreement. But the first thing that you need is the, the will of uh, the both presidents of uh, both uh, countries. And then the bureaucracy, they have to, to follow the, the rules dictated by the president. So it's a, it's a situation of will of really political will from the highest government officials. After the ambassador, you go to private sector. Uh, you can, uh, it's uh, the, what uh, is hard to get people to accept uh, the mobile services because it was new in the, in the world, the mobile. Yeah. No, Colombia was, people were very happy to have access to the mobile services. At the, at the beginning, it was only a luxury because they were expensive. But with time, it's so convenient that prices started to go down because there's a fierce competition. There were three operators and there was fierce competition between the three. The good thing that made the Colombian government to make prices go down is to open the sector to competition not to give the monopoly to a single firm. So with that, the prices went down and uh, people were able to acquire their mobile equipment. Mm -hmm. You have traveled to many countries in the region. Uh, was also necessary to help adjust the legal framework to make the telecom project work? We had to change all the framework and for that, we had the assessment of Canada. Canada was interested in, Bell Canada was one of the providers of cellular telephony. So the government of Canada is very smart because when they want a technology in one country, they give you free advice on how to policy that, how to make the framework, the legal framework to, for, for that new operation. So they gave us, gave us technicians, and advisors on how to make the framework for telephone, telephone, telephony. And then they already, the, the system was uh, similar to the Canadian system. So it was easy for, for Belcana to come into Colombia. Mm -hmm. uh, let's speak about the uh, election for election, election campaign. Uh, what is the legal framework for uh, fundraising for uh, elections? Colombia is a democracy with a president. There's a Congress with two cameras, with two chambers. Uh, one is the Senate, the other is the House. Uh, the Senate has 100 members. The House has uh, 240 members. And there's 18 ministers. It's a, it's a democracy. Mm -hmm. How can uh, you become an empowered uh, person in this process? How do I what? Uh, become empo empowered. Oh, because I was very strong. I had very strong ideas. I never went back on my ideas. I never said something that I had to repent from what I said. And I was a woman and it gave me an advantage because there were not so many women, women in government. So one woman was big news that one woman was in government and it was uh, the big, the big thing. So it was easy for me because so also uh, I was Jewish, so I was different. So they also called me the Jew, La Judea. And so I became a, I became a character in Colombian politics. Congratulations. How easy it's to raise the money for election? Uh, it's difficult 
but all the multinational companies are willing to give money because they are afraid of who the, what the president is going to do. And they donate money because they know that uh, they will have to ask favors from the government from the day the new president takes office. So they give money and so they have access later on to, to government. How is the work in the private sector and the public sector different? For the private sector, it's like working any place else in the world. I work in America and I work in Colombia and it's very similar. But in the public sector, you always have enemies. You have to be fighting little politics and people want uh, your help and that there are people after you and they are all, all the time suing you. It's very difficult to try to do something being in the government. Mm -hmm. After you worked in the gold team, <laughs> it's very interesting. What were the problems uh, in this uh, system? With which system? With gold. gold the problem we have with gold is that there's illegal mining. That there's a traditional mining that is made in the rivers uh, with the, uh, how do you call that? That you sieve the, the gold from the sand. Mm -hmm. So that's the traditional system. And many people do that activity, it's called barriqueros. But there are also people who are more technified and make mines, illegal mines in the all around the country because the country is rich in gold. So it's uh, illegal mining and it's protected by the guerrillas. So it's very difficult to fight against to fight against that. It's more easier to control from the supply for, from the demand side that, that the demand like uh, the Switzerland the Switzerland the, the, the Swiss uh, buyers they they try that the local that the gold that they are buying is legal so the, the way to control the illegacy is that the buyers demand that the gold be illegal in order to be acquired is there administrative resistance in the process uh, of combating illegal gold mining there's yes because they are protected by the guerrillas and by the paramilitary so it's very difficult. It's a it's a it's a it's a war on mining. Why the, is gold so stable in price? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew. I would be doing business with gold, but I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a few questions uh, about the uh, corporate corporate consultancy. Your specialization is adjusting legislation for the small uh, running of uh, business, yes? Yes. What do you do? <laughs> Explain, please, for a uh, student. Uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, what What do you do now? What do I do now? I'm retired. Uh, uh, you don't work now in uh, corporate uh, consultancy. No, I, I I closed my office. I had no more clients. My client had to close his business, and uh, he sees my services. So I, and now I'm retired. I'm living with my mother, and I live a very tranquil life. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. What is your favorite uh, project? Uh, what do you remember with uh, pleasure? I remember with pleasure my years at the embassy in Canada when we were doing uh, propaganda around Colombia. Not propaganda in the bad sense, but good propaganda, good reputation. I remember those years with uh, very, 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 very pleasurable for me. Have you had any contacts with people from Moldova during your uh, work time? No, only with you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my last uh, question is, uh, please send a message for uh, young people from Moldova, perhaps you dance in the choosing a profession or a way in life. Uh, we think you are 
very wise uh, and uh, your uh, words will be accepted for uh, young people from Moldova. <laughs> well, I advise young people to believe in themselves, in uh, make the most of what government can give you, but don't only, but they also rely on yourselves, in your capacities that you are able to do what you what you are planning, you will be able to, re to reach your dreams if you are true to yourself and believe in your own capabilities. Thank you very much. Maybe you have uh, something to say and I don't ask it? No, that, Dennis, thank you very much. You are being very kind to me. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. It's a pleasure for me to speak uh, with you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. And I, I think a lot about Moldova and going and traveling with Moldova to see the places where my parents were, were born. Welcome. If I can help to you with something, just say it's my pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.